Hello, it's Mrs. Potts with a short revision video on some of the key teachings for the Jewish belief section of paper two. So let's get started. The first um, and most important teaching in the whole of Judaism is called the Shema, and it's written here for you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And it's a direct address to the people of, of Israel, the Israelites, from God to say that God is one. You'll see down the bottom of the slide that there are eight topics at the bottom, and three of them are coloured in. These are the different topics from this unit, and it, this is just to show you how this quotation could potentially be used for some of them. The first and most obvious way is if you get on a question on, you know, explain how God is one, um, you can obviously use this, and you can also use it to contrast if you get the, the idea that God is a creator being his most important characteristic or God being the judge being his most important characteristic. Jews agree on this one. Everything else in Judaism is up for debate, whether that's what you should do with your life, what you should put in your body, who you should get married to, how to celebrate a festival or a, a ritual, um, even what, what happens to you after di you die. Jews agree that, he, uh, that God is one. You could also use it in an example of the Shekinah because it's obviously a direct address. It's a direct communication between God and people. And you could also use it for morals and the mitzvah. And the reason why is the longer version of the Shema has the stuff about wearing it um, on the body and hanging it on the door frames. So you start to, if you unpick it a little bit, then you start to get more teachings and more direction in terms of how you use it. So you'll know that Jews will put these little boxes on the door frames of their houses um, and they have a scroll with this quote, this quotation on. They're supposed to pray in the morning, they're supposed to pray in the evening. So there's a lot of direction about how you're supposed to use it. There are lots and lots and lots of ways to use it. Um, and if you do get it in a question and it's a D question, remember to link it to the first commandment, there is only one God. Um, so those two fit together nicely in a pair. The second teaching that uh, is in the top 10 is the teaching that God saw everything he had made and indeed it was very good. So obviously, again, we go back to the first topic that God is a creator. So we have the idea that God had made things and he was proud of those things that he made. That naturally leads us on to the sanctity of life teachings. So if God made everything and God believes it was good, it must be good. And therefore everything must be done to protect it. Steps must be taken by what God has made, humans, to be good stewards and to protect life at all costs. So that's the teaching on pikuach nefesh. So another way that you can use it there, it's not just about God's creator uh, role. You can also use it for life after death. Because if God makes everything, then of course he makes the He makes what happens afterwards too. And if you go back to the Torah, um, it talks about God creating the heavens and the earth. Now, what Jews believe about heaven isn't really clear, but they do believe in an afterlife. So if we take the, the keep to the vagueness there, you should be able to use it for those three topics. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. And again, this is coming back to three major topics for us. And they, they keep coming back in, in the same little boxes. So we've got the idea of God being a judge. We've got the idea of God being a lawgiver. So that ticks both of those boxes. One quote for two, two subtopics, if you like, in the nature of, in the nature of God. Uh, so the idea that God will give the laws in order to be able to judge people's behaviour on how well they've kept those laws. So that's obviously going to very clearly link in with morals in the mitzvot because it's talking about what all the what all the 630 mitzvot were for, what the purpose of them is. The purpose of them is, if it's a use the idea of law, um, it's to give us a way to behave, give us standards, give us guidelines, but also to judge us against how well we've met those things and then to maybe punish us. Here we get into life after death maybe to punish us or to reward us. So we have things like treasured possession and other quotations that match with that. This one is about the Shekinah. And basically it says this, you will know that Jews believe that today the Shekinah can be present in worship and in prayer and in study of the Torah. And this fits with the study of the Torah. And it says, if two sit together and the words between them are of the Torah, then the Shekinah is in their midst. So what that's saying is, if two people look at the Torah and talk about the Torah, then God will be with them, because the Shekinah just means God is present with them. So that means 
rather than um, trying to pray really hard or doing particular charitable actions, they can be have a very close relationship with God by discussing what's in the Torah. So when we talk about the idea that Jews don't believe, uh, don't agree on things, this is one reason why that would be considered to be a good thing, because if they're talking and debating what's in Torah, then actually God is with them. God is a witness to that discussion. And we're also going to be able to use that for morals and the mitzvot in terms of, you know, doing what God wants you to do, um, set down in the in, in the laws. Um, so, yeah. We move on a bit to the covenant with Abraham and the Shekinah here. And this is basically highlighting the fact that in the covenant there there is a there are conditions so god says that they will be the treasured possessions the jewish people will be raised above any other peoples of the earth um, among all peoples so they'll be treasured possessions and in fact you can just use the treasured and the possession part as the quotation if that's all you can remember so god says the jewish people will be blessed above all people but only if they keep the covenant only if they obey the rules. So in terms of how that links to these topics, it's the Shekinah because it is a direct conversation, if you like, um, between Abraham and Hashem the Lord. It obviously links with the covenant with Abraham because Abraham agrees to obey God's voice and he gets tested lots and lots of times by God to make sure that he is keeping it. And so therefore through the line of Abraham, he becomes a nation of priests. He gets the promised land on behalf of the behalf of the Jewish nation, and it's left to his descendants. Obviously, we've got that bit there again about obeying God's rules. And then, if it's the, the idea of treasured possession, the one way of you can interpret that would be maybe that means if you obey what God says, then you will receive a blessing after death. But again, that's not one hundred percent clear. There's not one hundred percent agreement on what that might look like. This is one of my favourite quotes from Judaism because it's it's just easy to remember and you, it also has its own built-in kind of evaluation. And it's it's this. So you know the story that Moses goes up the mountain to uh, have a conversation with Hashem the Lord because none of the Jews will do it. They're scared. Mount Sinai looks like a big wall of fire. And so even though Moses is like, come on, God wants to meet us, they're like, no, we're afraid, we don't want to. So Moses goes up on his own and he brings down the Decalogue and he makes it very clear to the people, this is what God wants us to do and this is what we need to follow. And that's not the end of the story. As you know, there are 613 mitzvot or commands and Moses has to keep going up and getting them, you know, a few at a time. <coughs> so overall, it takes a little while for the mitzvot to all be you know, to all be given, to all be shared by God or revealed by God. And there's what story that Moses goes up to to, to meet with God and, and to, to talk with, with Hashem the Lord. And um, he's sort of given the instructions, he's given the decalogue to the people and he says, look, this is what we need to do. He goes up the mountain and leaves them to it. When Moses comes down the mountain, unbeknownst to him, the people have got really worried about him. They feel like he's been there a long time. They're afraid of the fire and they think that Moses is probably dead. They think that God is angry with them. And so what they decide to do is to get all the metals that they have, the precious metals, and melt them down. And they make them into this golden calf, which you might have heard of, you might not have heard of. So they make them into this basically an idol and they start to worship it. So they feel that God's brought them out of Egypt and completely abandoned them. And so they need to please God or the gods somehow. And they make this golden calf and they start worshipping it. Now, Moses is obviously dirty, sweaty, tired. He's been uh, he's been communicating with Hashem, the Lord, all this time. He comes down the mountain and sees this happening. He goes absolutely mad and he smashes the tablets of stone, which has the Decalogue on. Um, because he's so angry, not with God, but he's angry with the people for not fulfilling their part of the covenant which was to to obey as we saw in a, a couple of slides ago um there's then this kind of little portion where um god is really angry with the people and he wants to punish them and start all over again and maybe kill them all and moses is kind of reminding god of the covenant that he made <coughs> um, and, and, and being really brave about it and and what happens is um it says that hashem kind of relents and he accepts Moses' word, he trusts Moses 
um, that, that they can do better. And he gives him two new tablets. So he gives him the new tablets of, of stone with the, with the Decalogue on. And it says here, he gave him two tablets of the covenant, tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And so the finger of God part is the part that you would use the quotation. So, so far, so easy to, to remember. But the thing with this is it has its own automatically built in evaluation. So you can use this quote for anything where you're saying uh, it's got something to do with Moses or it's got something to do with following the commands, the mitzvot, any mitzvot. You should say, oh, yeah, because they were given by the finger of God, blah, 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 blah. Whatever the, whatever the command is, whether that's about a food law or whether it's about how you worship in the temple, you can say that the commands were given by the finger of God, the mitzvot were given by the finger of God. However, God has no body and Jews don't believe that God has any physical body because why would he be um, constrained by the, the weaknesses of, of a human body? He doesn't need to be. So automatically you can say, well, they were given by the finger of God. However, this may not be a strong point because the Rambam's uh, 13 principles uh, of Judaism make clear that God has no physical body. And so therefore, how could they be produced? So it's a nice little quotation because it does it does more than one job for you. And as you can see from the bottom, it actually fits into a lot of the topics. So it's definitely one of the ones I would say worth rewinding this little bit and listening to it again just having it in your head and, and use it as often as you can because I honestly think that anytime you're talking about a command for, for a Jewish person which is going to be often you're going to be able to use this one this one is on Abraham and circumcision so it says it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you who is and you me and you he who is eight days old among you should be circumcised and he says that that's an everlasting part of the covenant so the covenant itself is not to be circumcised like I said earlier the covenant for Abraham is to obey and that's tested several times God says if he does obey he will give him certain things like he will give him the land for his people to dwell in he will make his ancestors a nation of priests and one of the tests, the first test that he gives him is to circumcise himself. And he says that that's the physical and everlasting sign that he's going to fulfill the commands, to obey the commands that God's given him. And so it's just one of those ones that kind of, it seems like it's a bit of a nothing. But um, if you've got a question on Abraham, you need to be able to say, or, or a question on circumcision, which isn't in this unit, um, but could come up on maybe on the, the mitzvot part, um, it is a sign, a physical sign of Jewishness. Now, the other thing to say about this, and it's something that I teach my class in, maybe some other people don't, but there is a part in uh, Leviticus that also says there should be no cuttings and dead flesh. So given that this part of the body um, can be kind of dispensed with, if you like, it suggests some people would use that scripture possibly to say that circumcision shouldn't take place it also um, gives us the idea that if the circumcision is the sign of Jewishness well what does that mean for Jewish women um, because they are Jewish as well and in fact you can only be Jewish a lot of people believe if your mum is Jewish it's a matrilineal uh, society <coughs> this one is for Pukuach Nefesh so the sanctity of life and really, you're just looking at a couple of words here. You're looking at the word desecrate. So it's a religious duty to desecrate Shabbat for any person afflicted with an illness that may prove Ill, uh, dangerous. So we know that people um, have very strict, Orthodox Jews have very strict laws about what they are and are not allowed to do on Shabbat. We know that. But the sanctity of life, the pikuach nefesh, overrides all of those and in fact it would be sinful for you to ignore someone who is ill because it's Shabbat oh well I know that they're really poorly and you know they, they might have a heart attack but it is Shabbat so I'm not allowed to use my phone or I'm not allowed to um I'm not allowed to go out and ask for help I can't drive them to the hospital it is an it's a religious precept so it means it's a duty it's not just something that's recommended it's something you have to do and I just love the use of the, the use of this word desecrate because desecrate means to obliterate something to destroy it so much it's unrecognizable so what the quotation is saying is that you must make the the, the sabbath absolutely unrecognizable if it proves it proves possible to save a life as part of that obviously you can look into if you are evaluating what what might be characterized as an illness does that include mental illnesses um 
maybe it does um and does it include things like so when we started talking about the how the sanctity of life affects what jews do the teachings on suicide and just to point out that this doesn't come from torah because it's this this concept didn't really uh, exist in the same way at that time it comes from the teachings of the rabbi the jewish laws later this is one for life after death so it says basically um that after you die you will be somehow gathered to their people. Um, this is uh, a, t- a teaching, I think, that's given to um, Aaron, who's Moses' brother. And um, it doesn't say, you know, that how he will be gathered to the people. It doesn't say where that will be. It just says on the mountain. Is that a reference to Gan Eden? Possibly. Is it a reference to somewhere else? It's going to be a future event. Um, so we've got that vagueness in there, but I just wanted to make sure that you had something that had had a bit to do with life after death. And then we have these final 13 principles of faith, these absolutely gorgeous um, ideas. So for those of you who aren't familiar with these, we have uh, an, an ancient Jewish scholar called Maimonides and his uh, the, the initials of his name, because his name is Rabbi. Um, the first part of his name, his name can be shortened to the Rambam. It's just funny and easy to remember. So that's why I use it um, because it, hopefully that will make you remember it. It's possibly a little bit disrespectful, but um, Jewish people would know who you mean if you talk about the Rambam because it's an acronym for his actual name. So he was a great Jewish scholar and he read very, very widely what the, the rabbis had said and he read Torah and studied it in depth. And he came up with basically the the safer matter um so he came up with a version of scripture that if you just read that and the torah you would know everything you need to know about judaism and he uh, basically distills everything that was in there into 13 major ideas and for most jews these are going to be things that they agree on and as you can see some of the things that you might think would be in there aren't in there so there's things like there's not things about how you do things there's not things um, in there about, um, I suppose, where things might happen after death. Um, they're not rituals, they're more beliefs. So they're fundamental beliefs that Jews have. And as I said before, even um, in terms of Orthodox, Orthodox Jews would believe these, but in terms of liberal Jews um, and reformed Jews, even some of these would be possibly discussed and debated so these go for everything so it's a bit like learning the Nicene Creed for a, for a Catholic you can use it for lots and lots of things so we have the idea that God exists we have the idea that God is one bam we can use that we know we can use that God is one on his own incorporeal means that he has no body so when we talked about the finger of God you're you coming back and saying God is has no body because it's in the Rambam certain principles of faith God is eternal, so that means he's there before time, he's there after time. We can only pray to God, so that's uh, linking up with this one about God being one and idolatry. You should have no other gods before but me. So we don't pray to anyone else. So things like Moses or the great the patriarchs, Abraham, we don't pray to them. The words of the prophets are true, so we can trust people like Noah, we can trust people like Moses, we can trust people like Abraham, we can trust David. Moses' prophecies are true, and Moses were the greatest of the prophets. Now, this is an interesting one. <coughs> I teach in my class that, you know, we could say that maybe Abraham is the most important because he had a, a more sustained relationship with Hashem the Lord for a longer time, and it was only because of Abraham that Moses existed. So it's interesting that it's something that you can bring in for debate there, that the Rambam says Moses is the greatest of the prophets. And I guess what does that mean to be the greatest? In terms of what he did... Yeah, he brought the mitzvot and he rescued them from slavery. But they were prophecies that were, uh, the prophecy about slavery, that was one that was given to Abraham. You know, your people will dwell somewhere else, but they won't be there forever. The Torah and the oral Torah were given to Moses. So it doesn't say it's exactly God's words, but it says that it's given from God. There will be no other Torah. God knows the thoughts and deeds of men. So we start to come into the idea of God being um, a judge and a lawgiver. So God knows people's thoughts and God knows what people do. God will reward the good and punish the wicked. So we start to get into life after death. We get the Messiah will come. 13 principles of faith says the Messiah will come and therefore 
most Jews are going to believe it's true. And then we'll get the idea of the resurrection of the dead. Um, when we teach the resurrection of the dead, we're not entirely sure is it the soul that resurrects or is it the body that resurrects? And that's going to impact people's beliefs on things like burial rites um, and transplant surgery and things like that. So I hope that's uh, useful for you. It's very quick. Um, any questions that you have, obviously feel free to send me a little email or a Teams message and I'll come back to you.